Lord, we thank you for the goodness of your hand and for the blessing you pour upon your people every day. Thank you, Lord, because of your favor and your mercy and your love and compassion. Thank you for the salvation of our souls. Thank you for the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Lord, we pray that nothing on earth and nothing from the pit of hell will take this salvation from your people in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, every day to appreciate every good thing that you have done for us. And then, as a result of that, we lay our lives down to serve you acceptably, Lord. Thank you, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. We're looking in at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 1. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because the widows were neglected in the daily ministration. As we look at that verse, you find what happened in the early church. And that thing that happened in the early church could have crippled the church, could have weakened the church, could have destroyed the church, except that a solution was brought immediately. It was a disease, a disease for the body, for the body of Christ, just like a disease or sickness in your own body that threatens your health. Threatens your happiness and threatens your progress and threatens every good thing the Lord wants to do in your life. There are diseases which threaten the life of the human body, and you need to know as well there are diseases that threaten the life of Christ's body, the church. And such diseases kill people prematurely. We're told that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verses 10 and 11, a kind of disease that came to the body, to the assembly, to the congregation at the time of Moses. And that disease became a kind of terminal disease that destroyed almost the whole congregation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 10, now all these happened unto them in verse 11. For examples, and they are reaching for admonition and learning, our instruction, upon whom the ends of the world are come. What were the things that happened? The Paul, the apostle, was referring to, and he's saying, Corinthian church, you're like a body, the body of Christ. And if you allow this terminal disease to take root in your life, it will literally destroy and kill all the cells of the body. Look at verse 10. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. That was the disease, murmuring, that came in their midst. And it happened to become a life-threatening disease in that assembly. We're looking at First Corinthians chapter 11, looking at verse 30. And you'll see that those people that are supposed to be worshipping the Lord and rejoicing the gifts of the Spirit, allowed some things to come into that body. And that eventually destroyed many of them. First Corinthians chapter 11 verse 30, for this cause, for this reason, just because of this, not because it was the will of God, not because it was the plan of God, not because this was God, what God intended originally, but because of the disease that came in, into the body. It says, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many die, many sleep. As we think about uh, the early church, and you think about that church in Acts of the Apostles that were filled with the Holy Ghost, and those people arch the word of God be paid to them without fear, without favor. You have the grace of God flowing into their lives. You have the power of the Holy Ghost manifested in an unprecedented manner. And yet something came in. 
And that thing that came in, the apostles recognized immediately this was going to be a life threatening disease. I'm coming back to Acts of the Apostles again, chapter 6. Before chapter 6, you know what had happened? The church was united together. The members and the ministers, the members and the leaders, the leaders and their followers, in one accord together. And great was the manifestation of the power of God. Persecution came from outside. But that persecution from outside couldn't have any effect on them. In fact, it became even stronger. And became more bold as a result of the pressure coming from the outside. Now this came from the inside. And it says, in those days, in those days of rejoicing in the Lord, in those days of revival, in those days of spiritual life coming through everybody, in those days of the manifestation of power, like in the days of Jesus Christ all over again in the church, in those days, in those days when Gamaliel rose up, and he said, you people, these people of the Sanhedrin, what, what should you do? Because if this be of God, nothing will be able to destroy this. But if it be of man, it will fizzle out by itself, or kill itself, destroy itself. But if it be of God, be watchful what you do. Let's be found fighting against God in those days of spiritual protection upon the people. When the number of disciples was multiplied and God was just blessing the evangelism and their outreach and their discipleship making and God bless everything that they did in the church and disciples who have been born again people have been born again and developed in the Lord and they multiplied it says there arose a murmuring of the gracious against the Hebrews because of the widows were neglected in the daily ministration about food about material things, about non-essentials, about passing things, material things that didn't matter at all. You're going to find out that is this little, little things, inconsequential things, insignificant things, people are allowed to destroy their lives, to kill them, to scatter them. And to stop the great work of God that is doing among the people. You find the same thing with the children of Israel. They are loud, just murmuring over food. They forgot the Red Sea that was divided. They forgot all those great miracles God did for them in the land of Egypt. And they forgot everything that Moses made to them. The little thing, what are we going to drink and what are we going to eat and our soul is not fed up of this manner. Those non-essentials capture their interest, almost kill them, almost destroy them. In fact, it was because of those little, little things, many of them did not get to the land of Canaan, the land of promise. Not because they broke the Ten Commandments, actually the Ten Commandments were intact. But some of them, many of them that more much in the wilderness, it was because of the things that mattered not. The things we take in today and then we pass out tomorrow. The things of passing value, of low value. Those were the things that hindered them from having the promise of the Lord they have given to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. That's why we need to look at this. I'm talking to you today on the healing of a life-threatening disease. The healing of a life-threatening disease. The disease of murmuring. The disease of allowing those passing things, non-essentials, unimportant things, inconsequential things to so take root in your life. And then you allow murmuring and grumbling and discord and complaining and then your life is gone just because of the three points in the message. Number one, highlighting the deadly disease of murmuring. Highlighting it. Beginning it to view that you will see yourself. What the Lord says about it. What he did to people before us. What he can do to us who don't take care of it. Number two, healing the deadly disease of murmuring. Once you find it in your heart, in your life. Also find it, destroy your family and destroy your local assembly. Getting rid of it immediately. Healing the deadly disease of murmuring. Number three, holiness of disciples delivered from murmuring. 
The disciples were delivered from murmuring the holiness, the kind of lifestyle, their character, their conduct, the kind of life they made because of that deliverance from that disease of murmuring. Number one. What's number one? Highlighting the deadly disease of murmuring. Exodus chapter 16. In Exodus chapter 16, I'm reading from verses 2 and 3. Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 and 3. It says, And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Can you imagine these people? It appears you think they have never got any blessings from the Lord, their redemption, they forgot, their salvation, they forgot, the joy in the Lord, they forgot, the singing, the, they just finished singing in chapter 15. How glorious the Lord is. How wonderful the Lord is. And then he said, Our God is holy. Our God is mighty. Our God is powerful. He made the horses and the riders to be drowned in the sea. They glorified the Lord just because of food. Because of their tummy. Because of their belly. Now they forgot everything. And it says they murmured. By the way, this was the four seasons of murmuring. And why murmur? When you can ask. Eventually they asked. Eventually they prayed. Eventually Moses prayed. Why make prayer the last thing? Why don't you make that the first? Why make the request before the people of God the last thing? Why, make, why don't you make that the first? Why are we so slow in understanding that everything that happens we must first murmur and then when we get into trouble by murmuring is then we we'll remember, oh we can pray, oh we can ask, oh we can discuss, oh we can share our minds together, oh we can reveal our request to the leadership. But they did the last. Look at verse 7. And in the morning ye shall, ye shall see the glory of the Lord. For that ye hear, for that ye heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that ye murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full. For that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. He said it's against him your murmuring For what are we? Your murmurings are not against us But against the Lord Murmuring overlooked The danger ahead There was danger ahead of them They were in the wilderness The serpents in the wilderness they forgot The drought in the wilderness they forgot if God should abandon them in the wilderness They forgot all about that And because of the little problem of the present time They forgot all the danger ahead of them They forgot they needed God Much more than when they were in Egypt And now because of the forgetfulness They murmured against the Lord Look at Exodus chapter 17 verse 2 Wherefore the people did chide with Moses They quarreled with Moses They strove with Moses And said Give us water that we may drink. Hey, my friend, there's another way you could say that. You could go and say, please, uh, leader Moses, we're thirsty. Can we have some water to drink? What are you going to do? We praise God for all the miracles God has performed through you. How those magicians were silenced. And how Pharaoh was drowned in the Red Sea. And we thank the Lord for the mighty things he has done for us. But now, we have a need. We, have some, we need some water to drink. There's another way you could say that. That's how you can make your request before the Lord and before the leadership. But no, they said, give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, why chide ye with me? Why strive? Why quarrel? Why fight? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And the, and the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, Don't we have another method to be able to satisfy our need? Isn't there another approach that these children of Israel could have taken? 
and the water will still be supplied? Is there not a better way? Why are we so kind of straight jacketed that it's always like this? We must make a request known. There's a more pleasant way. There's a better way. There's, there, there's a way the children of God, those who are saved and those who have the grace of God in their lives, there's a gracious way. They make their request known. And so Moses said, Why do you fight with me, or child against me? Wherefore is this that thou hast brought? Why for you brought us out of Egypt to kill us? And our children and our cattle were thirst. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, what shall I do unto these people? They be almost ready to what? Tell me out loud. Stone me. I told you a parable, a fable. The scorpion said to the frog. You remember that fable? Can you please get me to the other side of the lake, of the other side of the river? And the frog said, oh, can I take you to the other side? Because scorpions sting frogs. If I carry you on my back, trying to help you, I'm trying to get you to the other side of the river. When we get to the middle, you stink me and I will die. Oh, and the scorpion said, hey, Mr. Frog, listen to this. I can't do that. Because if I do that, and you drown, I drown myself because I cannot swim. Therefore, if I hurt you, I hurt myself. Oh, the frog said, Mr. Scorpion, Looks like you are reasonable today. Jump on my back. And he jumped on his back. When he got to the middle of the river, man, the scorpion stung him. See, Mr. Scorpion, see what you have done. Why have you done this? He said, I'm sorry, that's my nature. Your nature is killing you. Look at here, Moses. Here is Moses. All these Israelites, they don't know how to perform miracle. What did they know how to bring water out of the rock? What do they know? How to cross the wilderness and get to the land of Canaan. And Moses said, they'd be almost ready to stone me. If you stone the man, you perish in the wilderness, you hurt yourself. We come back again to that fable of the frog and the scorpion. Scorpion, whatever you do to that frog, you do it against yourself. You'll drown because you cannot swim. And so, these Israelites they didn't understand. They felt they were just grumbling and murmuring against Moses. Well, when does a man do much? When does he manifest the gift of the Spirit? When does he pray for the sick to get well? When does he open himself to the guidance of the Holy Spirit and direct the congregation? When the man is happy. When there is no care here, there is no care there, there is no concern there, the man is free. When there is love, when he feels that the people, they love him, they are not stoning him, they are not killing him. He's so happy, he's able to pray with faith, and able to pray with enthusiasm, able to pray with excitement. And then the person that will pray for there with excitement, with faith, with happiness, with joy, the joy of the Lord is your strength, they wanted to stone him. And the man is having a personal problem, the people hate me, and what am I going to do? While he's thinking about personal problem, I is he going to pray with faith? For even the water they were asking for, for that to be supplied. They didn't understand. They were killing themselves. That's why Moses cried unto the Lord. Instead of praying for the people, he was praying for himself. He said, Lord, do something now because I'm, I'm afraid for my life. Because they'll be almost ready to stone me. Make your leaders happy. So that they are not just praying for themselves. I pray, oh God, save me from persecution. Save me from hatred. Protect me from this. Protect me from that. Release your leaders. When we murmur against them, we fight against them, child against them, striving against them, they'll be busy praying for themselves, personal protection and personal happiness and personal joy, personal this, oh Lord, take care of me, it looks like this and that. Release your leaders to just pray for you. By the way, do you know that in this same chapter, look at verse 8, verse 8, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rufidim. The Amalek, Amalekites were right at the corner, about to destroy them, about to kill them. And here they were chiding and striving and fighting about water. 
And then the water to even stone Moses because of no water to drink when the Amalekites were there. And it says, And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out and fight with, them, with Amalek. And tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. Nobody could manifest the power in that rod except Moses. They wanted to stone him. And now here was Amalek, the Amalekites. If they had killed Moses and stoned Moses because of water to drink, you might get water to drink. And then you get rid of the man. And then the Amalekites came. What are you going to do? It was Moses that solved the problem. And then he says, So Joshua did as Moses had, had said unto him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and all went to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Anytime that Moses was tired, enemies prevailed. Anytime his hands were down, enemies prevailed. Anytime he was so discouraged and depressed, unhappy, and he couldn't, you know, keep up his Sunday anymore because he has so much pressure upon his life, enemies prevailed. That's why we're told that in verse, in verse 12, but Moses' hands were heavy, and he took his stone and put it under him, and sat, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and us stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. What's the result? I said, What's the result? And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. I wish I were there in the land of Israel. And I tell those people, be reasonable, be wise, stop all the murmuring. Let Moses have some fresh air to breathe so that he'll be able to minister the best unto you. Let's look at Numbers chapter 14. Highlighting the deadly disease of murmuring. That thing killed them, destroyed them. Their murmuring injured them, hurt them. And the murmuring was about non-essentials. Have you ever thought about that? Non-essentials. Food. Water to drink. The mundane things of this life. And they forgot the very essential, important things of life. Murmuring. We're looking at Numbers chapter 14, verse 21. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and I'm not hacking to my voice. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. Their murmuring cut them off from the land of Canaan. These people were not thinking of the future. And Moses had told them the land we're going is a land filled with a lot of things. A, fl a land flowing with milk and honey. Whatever you miss here today, you're going to get it in the land we're going. Because all the fruits of the land, all the houses of the people, all the fertile ground, everything belongs to you. Just be patient a little. And don't more because of the heat of the day today, because of the future. Think of the future, think of yourself, and think of the great reward that is coming unto you. And when you think of that, then the, the present day needs or pressures or problems are not going to be so important. You look at verse 26. In verse 26, and the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? Have you noticed something here? At this time now, they didn't worship idol, but God just overlooked that. At this time, they didn't make any idol to themselves. God just overlooked that. At this time, they didn't call the name of the Lord in vain. God overlooked that. At this time, they were not breaking the Sabbath day law. God overlooked that. At this time, they were honoring their father and honoring their mother. God overlooked that. At this time, they were not stealing. They were not committing adultery. They were not uh, being covetous. All the commandments, everything was in place. There was no complaint about that. Only there is murmuring. You know what murmuring does? Every other good quality in your life becomes overlooked. 
And every good thing you do. You're living a righteous life. You're living a holy life. And then you are, you know, giving to the poor. You are very generous. You are merciful. You are compassionate. Every other thing is in place in your life. When murmuring comes in, every other good thing is overlooked. You lose the benefit of the good things you have done. Of the good things you are doing. When the memory comes in, and the Lord said, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard their memories, the memories of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, says the Lord, as ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. They will die. That's why we call the murmuring a life threatening disease. It killed them. It destroyed them. Look at verse 36. In verse 36, it says, And the men which Moses sent to, to search the land, who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him. They made the congregation to murmur by what they said, by the evil report they gave. The Lord hated memory so much that even the people that instigated that memory by bringing up his land upon the land, even those men in verse 37 that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. You see that? Cut short their lives. Memory, a life threatening disease. It's not something we gamble with, something we play with, when we murmur, we instigate other people, influence other people to murmur. Cut short our lives. All the other good qualities we have and the good things we have done, everything is forgotten because we murmur and because we allow other people to murmur. Like a spoiled children, those Israelites, spoiled children, they murmured against God and against Moses, but they only groaned under the taskmasters of Egypt. Have you thought about that? What have they seen here? More than what they saw in Egypt. In Egypt, the oppression was much. The lashes on their back. The denial forced on them. The slavery that they forced on them in Egypt. They didn't eat more more. They didn't eat more more against Pharaoh. They didn't eat more more against those dark masters. All they did was to cry, not more more. All they did was to grow. Oh Lord, look at our condition. They didn't eat more more. When you think about the church, and where maybe you're teaching in school, and your principal, your headmaster, is kind of ferocious, furious, and a tyrant. You don't murmur. You just send prayer request. Church, pray for me. I'm going through a hard time. Over there you cry. Over there you groan. Over here you come to murmur. And then when you learn Lord, he comes and he says, Now I double the rent. He did that three months ago. And he comes and he says again, Hey, everybody, I want to renovate my house. If you are not happy, if you want to go, go. If you want to stay, I'm adding this. You only groan, you don't murmur. You cry, you pray, you fast. But when you come to the church, with all the good things happening to us in the church, with all the blessings we're receiving in the church, a little problem. The things we endure with the landlords, the things we deal with our principals at school, the things we deal with all those directors and managers and the people that are ruling over, over us there with tyranny. We don't, we don't grumble. We don't, we don't even leave the job. We even stay on the job. We're afraid if I lose this job, what else will I get? If a fraction of that happens to us in the church, we're saying, which church will I go? I think I'll go to that church. I think I'll go to that church because this is our deeper life. Look at this. Look at this. Hey, look at this. We taught you about salvation. You knew nothing about salvation until our leaders taught you. It was sanctification and the joy of the Lord and the hope of heaven. All the good, good things you have received. You forgot everything. And here you murmur and murmur over there. You endure. Come on now. Turn around and give us some breathing space and show some patience. The kind of patience to show. 
to the people who are pressing in your places of work. Look at Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. I'm reading there from verse 23. Exodus chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 23. And see the attitude of those children of Israel when those tax masters oppress them. They do it more, more then. How is it? It was when Moses came and left everything behind, leading them in the wilderness of the land of Canaan. That's when Mormon started. Chapter 2 of Exodus, verse 23. And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died. And the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried, they did more, more and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning, God, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. Why didn't they manifest such attitude now that the Lord has done so much for them? No, it was only murmuring at this time. Let's look at Psalm 106. Psalm 106. I'm reading from verse 21. Psalm 106, verse 21. They forgot God their Savior. That's what murmuring does. It makes us to forget what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. His groaning, his tears, his cry. His pain, the crucifixion, is going in a punishment for us. We forget that when we begin to mumble. It says they forgot God, their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and terrible things by the Red Sea. Therefore, he said that he would destroy them. At not Moses has chosen stood before him in the in the bridge to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. Yea, they despised the pleasant land and they believed not his word, but murmured in their tents. Murmured in their tents. Instead of remembering the promises of God and repeating the promises of God and claiming the promises of God and praying with the promises of God, murmuring cancelled the prayer. Murmuring weakened their faith. Murmuring kind of blocked their memory. They couldn't even remember the great things the Lord had done, but they murmured in verse 25 in their tents, and they hearkened not to the voice of the Lord. Therefore he lifted up his hand against them and over to overthrow them in the wilderness, and to overthrow their seed also among the nations, and to scatter them in the lands. How about the things they even murmured about? Look at verse 15. He gave them the request, but sent leanness into their soul. When you ask for the blessing of God in the normal way, you enjoy that blessing when it comes. But when you get it by murmuring, when you get it by rioting, when you get it by instigating other people, when you get it by striving and kind of chiding with Moses and the leadership, you might get it eventually. You have your way, but it sends leanness to your soul. What benefit are you going to receive from that? We're looking at Jude verse 11. Jude, I read from verse 11. The people that murmur today, what happens to them? What do they get to eventually? Jude verse 11. Warn to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the arrow of Balaam for reward and perished. And the game saying of Cory, that's Korah. Korah murmured of Dithan and Abiram. And he told Moses, You make yourself somebody. And you put yourself on the congregation. The whole congregation is holy. Are you making yourself as if you are a special person? That's what they said. The, those people, they forgot the whole congregation. When they needed water, why didn't good they go to the whole congregation? Why did they come to Moses? And when they needed food, when did they go to Moses? If everybody was like Moses. And when the plague was breaking out and destroying thousands of them, when did they go to all those people? Everybody is holy, everybody is righteous. And then, you know, everybody can do what you are doing. Why did they go to them? The murmuring was unreasonable. And it says in the church, there are people that go in the way of Korah. 
that she is in the gates and they perish. It says, These are sports, verse 12, in the feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruits withereth, without fruits twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Those are the murmurers. You know, when you begin to murmur like that, it serves your own Christian life. You become shallow, you become empty, you become dry. Whatever you are passing out is just of the flesh. Because of a murmuring of recent, you have been murmuring recently, and since you are murmuring, the Spirit of God cannot remain. The freshness of the Lord cannot remain. Insight into the divine will cannot remain. They are just dry and shallow and superficial. And since now there are clouds without water, and the trees whose fruits are twice dead all over, reaching waves in the statin of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the servant from Adam, prophesied of these saying. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten, with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all the ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches. Hard speeches. When people murmur, they say things that say, ah, you have not to say that. You can say that. Against God, against Christ. When they murmur, you open your mouth. You can do that against our leader. You can say that against our group coordinator. When they murmur, they forget themselves. And they have these hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers. Verse 16, they are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts. And their most speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. What that means is if somebody is murmuring and you don't appreciate it, don't stop. If you don't smile, if you don't look at them, if you don't appreciate them, if you just say, uh uh. You of all people say you can do that. And then you look away. And you see that murmuring belittles them. Murmuring kind of cuts them down. Murmuring makes them nothing. And then when they see that everybody is looking away, that they see that as a whole church, we don't appreciate people that murmur against God. And they murmur against our pastor, against our leaders. They will stop. Because it says what they want, they have men's persons or men's persons in admiration. Once you admire them and you are congratulating them, and you are bold, you are courageous, to have nobody against Moses, against the Lord, against the Lord. I, I kind of envy you, I couldn't have done that, but you people, you are bold. Oh, when I was one like that, and they know that she, that's what they are looking for. They have men's persistent admiration. But if you look down, them, I'll just say, Well, I didn't know you could do that. As you've done that, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, my hand is not that. I'm not going to praise you for that. They'll stop. Point number two healing the deadly disease of murmuring. Get it healed. Get it healed. Don't allow it to fester, to expand, to continue. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 23, verse 24. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 23. But when he seeth his children, the work of, the, of mine hand, in the midst of him, they shall sanctify my name, and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob. And shall fear the God of Israel. They also that hear the Spirit shall come to understanding. And they that know much shall do what? Shall learn doctrine. The people that murmured in the past, when the Lord's hand begins to touch us, 
begins to turn all around. When the Lord signs begin to kind of transform our lives. And then he cancels all that from our lifestyle. And then we know there's a better way. If you want to have anything good from the Lord, there's a better way than murmuring. If you want to have some opportunities from our leadership in the church, there is a better way. If you want us to move fast and go further in the things of the Lord and all rejoice together and express a greater, mightier revival, there's a better way than murmuring. I'll begin to learn the doctrines all over again. I'll begin to learn the lifestyle of Christ once again. It says those that murmured in the past, they'll stop the murmuring and they learn doctrine. Let's come to Numbers again. Numbers chapter 17. Numbers chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 1. The Lord wanted to stop this murmuring among the children of Israel because it was becoming too much, too much, too much. That you know, almost every step of the way, murmuring, murmuring, murmuring. Some people died, they still keep on murmuring and murmuring. And the Lord said, this must stop. It was stop. I said it was stop. I think we will now have the right way. And we know how to get what you want to get. We know the power of prayer. And we know the goodness and the promises of the Lord. And we know how to be happy. And to make others happy. And we know what the Christian life is all about. So we understand that it's not just murmuring and grumbling and complaining. That we are not going to move forward fast if we do that. Numbers chapter 17 verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and take every one of them a rod according to the house of their fathers, of all their princes according to the house of their fathers. Twelve rods, write thou every man's name upon his rod, and thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi, for one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers and thou shalt lead them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony where I will meet you and it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall bosom and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel whereby they murmur against you he said, bring the rocks together. That is, one for each tribe. And Aaron will represent the tribe of Levi. And bring that before me. The following day, come and check up. And the rod that bursts, that brings of fruit. They will know that that's the person I've chosen. All the other eleven rods will remain as dry as ever. And then they will know, I've not chosen those people. And all the murmuring and carnal comparison. I see, what can Aaron do that we cannot do? What can Moses do that we cannot do? What has he seen that we have not seen? I'll take all that away from you. Look at verse 10. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token, for a sign, for a symbol against the rebels. And thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me that they die not the healing of that deadly disease called murmuring that ought to be healed I pray to be healed in our midst in Jesus name John chapter 6 in John chapter 6 we're reading from verse 43 John chapter 6 verse 43 healing the deadly disease of murmuring Reading from verse 43, chapter 6 of John. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. Why are you murmuring? Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent him, draw, which has sent me, draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. Don't worry. If you are one of the people the Lord has chosen, they will come. And if you, are not, if you have not come, and you are out there, don't grudge the people who have come. Don't grumble against the people who have come. If the blessing is not in your life, don't grudge them. Don't murmur. If you will surrender to the Lord, 
the Lord will show the same favor unto you as well. If the favor has not been shown unto you, it means that you have not put yourself in the right place. Don't murmur. It says, everyone, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me, draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is, it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that has heard and has learned of the Father, cometh unto me. He said, you don't have any reason to murmur because what is happening is what God has ordained, is what God has done. There's no reason to murmur. You don't understand anything, go back to the Lord and check up. That you will put murmuring away from our knees. We're looking at Job chapter 21. Job chapter 21. Your personal decision not to murmur. Your personal decision not to grumble. Your personal decision not to complain. Why? Look at this. In Job chapter 21 verse 4. As for me, my complaint is my complaint to man. And if it was, it was so, why should not my spirit be troubled? Job said, think about me. I have a lot of problems. Think about me. And see the sickness that came upon his body. He said, think about me. And see all this. But can I complain to any man? He said, if I were to complain to man, I'll not be surprised why my spirit should be troubled. The people who murmur, they murmur against me. They murmur against women. They murmur against their husband. They murmur against their wife. They murmur against their parents. They murmur against their children. And the murmuring, it only troubles your spirit. You trouble yourself more and more. When you see that God will not allow the problem to be solved through murmuring. You know why? If God allows your problem to be solved through murmuring, murmuring will take the glory. God will not take the glory. You say, if I didn't do that, that thing will not be solved. If I didn't go that way, they won't look at me. If I didn't approach it that particular way, this thing I have now, I will not have. You will not give the glory to God if God allowed murmuring to, to work. That's the reason why the problem will not be solved. It will only increase. And when it increases, it will trouble your spirit, trouble your soul. You say with all the complaints, with all the murmuring, with all the things that were done, with all the petition, the problem is still there. Then you will murmur more. And then the problems will increase. Why are you not wise and stop the murmuring? Look at that verse 4 again. As for me, is my complaint to man? And if it were so, why should not my spirit be troubled? For us to be free, we must stop the murmuring. I pray it will stop. It's even unwise to murmur. Because you trouble yourself. You disappoint yourself when you murmur. And then you're looking for solution. And then the people that respected you before, that loved you before, you now say, I didn't know that it's of that kind of mold of mind. I didn't know that it was, you know, among the backsliders too. I didn't know that it's among the people that they're never grateful. They never show gratitude to God. I didn't know it was that kind of person. The people that respected you and loved you before, they will say, hmm, I thought she had grace. I thought she was gracious. I thought she had the spirit of God. And I thought the fruit of the spirit, I thought they were there. I didn't know it's as shallow as other people, as backsliding as other people. If you want to keep your Christian life and the respect that people have for you, you stop the murmuring so that they know you are all the gracious people, compassionate people, appreciative people. Grateful. You have gratitude instead of murmuring. Lamentation. Chapter 3, verse 37. Lamentation chapter 3, verse 37. We see that says, and it cometh to pass, when the Lord has, not com has commanded it not, out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not evil and good. Wherefore does a living man complain? A man for the punishment of his sins. Here Jeremiah who wrote lamentation is calling us to wisdom. He said, think about whatever happens to you. 
most likely you cost it by yourself. And what should you complain? A man for the punishment, for the rebuke and the reproach of his sins. It's what you brought upon yourself. And if you continue bringing it upon yourself, it's not going to ease. It's not going to decrease. It's going to increase. And the body is going, the pressure is going to be more. That's why it says, let us search and try our ways. And let us turn again unto the Lord. That's how to solve the problem. And then the murmuring will come to an end. Psalm 142. Psalm 142. I'm going to read the whole psalm, but I'm going to read verse 2 first. Psalm 142. We're reading the whole psalm, but look at verse 2. 142. We're looking at verse 2. I poured out my complaint before him. Not before people. You don't go about murmuring, grumbling, complaining. Talking about this, talking about that. A coordinator, this is the way things are. Group coordinator, look at this one. The children of the coordinator, children of the group coordinator, look at this, look at that. After all, this and, and all that is murmuring. There's something that is biting you within. You're not telling people. There's something you're dissatisfied about. You're not telling people. There's something you're unhappy about. You're not telling people. And you can't pray. There you are. You can't even cut the promise, take the promise of God. You can't go to that leader. And the Bible says here, if you have ought against your brother, go to him. Between you and him alone. And if he hears you, then you gain your brother. Instead of going about and murmuring. If he has not heard, go to two other people in the fellowship and bring them together. So they listen. If he was still not here, there's no cause for murmuring. Then go to the church, leadership of the church, and take with it before the church. No anger, no strife, no quarreling, no struggling, no murmuring. Take the steps that Jesus has given us to take. If you're a real child of God, otherwise you're just a sinner, you're just a backslider. And you don't have the leadership and the authority and rulership of Christ over your head. It says, I put out my complaint before the Lord. I showed before him my trouble. Come to verse 1 now. Psalm 142. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I put out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my past. In the way wherein I watch, at the privilege laid is near for me. I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. He didn't, he didn't because of that complete man, he complete before God. My refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord, I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors. For they are stronger than I. You didn't murmur because of that. You went to the Lord. Whenever you have any challenge, go to the Lord in prayer. And pour out your soul, your heart before the Lord. That's what real Christians do. Bring my soul out of prison that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about. For thou shalt deal bountifully with me. Give me a good amen. amen. The righteous shall compass me about. What if when the problem was there, you murmured against every righteous man, every righteous woman, every righteous leader, everyone around you. You hated everybody. You have negative attitude towards everybody because of your problem. Did they cause your problem? How are you murmuring against them? And who are the people to help you anyway? The people to surround you and take care of you and to compass you. The same righteous people you are murmuring against. Therefore, we stop all the murmuring and have the right attitude. Psalm 141. Psalm 141 from verse 1. Lord, I cry unto thee. 
Nikkeist unto me. Give ear unto my voice. When I cry unto thee, not unto man, let my prayer be set forth before thee. And, in, and in, as, as incense, and li the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. When troubles arise, keep my mouth. When the pressure is greater than what it was yesterday, keep my mouth. When you keep my mouth and keep my spirit and my heart, then I will not speak foolishly before you. Incline not my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men that walk in equity. And let me not each of their duties. Let the righteous do what? Smite me. Are you born again? You cannot bear a little correction. Ah, ah. Let's go back home again. The Lord came and said, Ah, ah. What's this compound like this? And the place is so dirty. You tell us, what are you doing? Are you people? Are you educated people? You're living here in, in the midst of dirt. Come on. Before I come next time, clean up this environment. You don't get offended. That is gone. You take broom and then you take extra time and clean everywhere. They say there's still something that you clean it because the landlord said, Don't make my house dirty like this. You didn't grumble. You didn't complain. You didn't murmur. You know it was my fault. When you send the church, if any of our coordinators go coordinator, ah, ah, how is the church dirty like this? What are we doing? The houses where we're living, can it be dirty like this? People, what are we doing? And you sisters, you are there. Now, let's do something. They will begin to murmur. What's, what's the problem? When the landlord said the same thing, we didn't murmur. The teacher came and said, Ah, look at the class today. Who put all this litter here? I'm not going to teach you now. Or students, get up here. Make sure that this place is clean. If you want to make good grace, want me to teach well here, clean up this environment. Nobody murmurs. The stress will just get up and very good. They will not giggle and laugh and make fun. They just clean up immediately. They don't grumble. Now, we come. And then our preacher, our coordinator, says, uh, brothers and sisters, looks like, uh, you know, we, we must keep our environment clean. Then we get offended. What's the matter with us? And we murmur unnecessarily. Let the righteous smite me. Even if they do it in a way that will feel the pain. I will say, why is our coordinator talking like that? He doesn't talk gentle. He just, you know, anytime what he wants is what he wants. It's our coordinator. Now let him talk. Maybe that's how God wants him to address us. It's a group coordinator. Let him talk. That's how God wants him to correct us. Let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness. That's how we know who are born again. What a lot of people are not really born again. And a little thing will rub them the wrong direction. You cannot talk to them to even make their lives better. To sit upright. To believe the word of God. To stand on the word of God. They get offended because they want them to be holy. You want them to be righteous. You want them to get to heaven. Complaining. Complaining. Murmuring. I pray it will stop. I said I pray it will stop. And the righteous might meet shall be kindness. Let him reprove me. It shall be excellent oil. Which shall not break my head. For yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. If those leaders ever get into trouble, I will pray as if they were my real, real, real father and real mother. That's the right attitude to have. I pray God will give it to us in Jesus' name. Point number three, holiness of disciples, the disciples who are delivered from murmuring. Holiness. Purity. Sanctification. A clean heart, a pure heart, the transformed life of those disciples 
were delivered from murmuring. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. Leviticus chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be holy. Obviously, he was uh, telling them, children of Israel, I'm fed up with your murmuring. Sanctify yourselves, be holy. Korah, Dathan, Abiram, this is enough. I'm fed up with your murmurings. Sanctify yourselves and be ye holy. Oh, you Levites. You're supposed to serve me. You know why? You should have died in Egypt. When I killed all the firstborn, I claimed all the firstborn for myself. And then you now, um, now you replace the people that are the firstborn because they sacrifice to idols. I brought you to myself and I make myself your possession. And therefore you actually should, you should not be living now. You should be dead already. I give you a borrowed time. And you're living on borrowed time. Therefore, anything you have to do, do it with gratitude and do it with joy. Because I spared your life just to serve me. And all that murmuring cut it off. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. Verse 8, and ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord, which do what? Which sanctify you. Look at verse 26. And ye shall be holy unto me. You are holy because of him. Not because you are happy. Not because you are glad. No, because the manna increased today. No, because you got extra water to drink out of the rock. It's done enough. Even if he doesn't do any other thing again, it's done enough. He did enough when he sent his only begotten son to the cross of Calvary to die for you. That's enough. He did enough when he took you away from sin. And he saved you. And he wrote your name in the book of life in heaven. He did enough. That's enough. He did enough when he gave you the joy of salvation. And he made the spirit of God to bear witness in your heart. That you are a child of God. He did enough. He did enough when he went to heaven to make and build mansions for you. My father saw so many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. It's done enough. He did enough when he said, I'm coming back to take you to myself. It's done enough. Even if he has not done any other thing today, he has done enough. But he did today. You slept last night. You didn't know where you were. Rapper went the other way. You went the other way. And this morning you woke up. Heal and hearty and sound is done something. And here you are as we're talking. This day, some people have died already today. But you're still alive. It's done enough. And it says, because of that, you must be holy unto me. You shall be holy unto me. For I, the Lord, am holy. And, and I've said not separated you from all the people that you should be mine. It says show gratitude. Instead of murmuring and murmuring and murmuring, show gratitude. There will be no murmuring again. I said there will be no murmuring again. Philippians chapter 2 from verse 14. Philippians chapter 2 from verse 14. Do how many things? All things without murmurings and disputing. You can tell when somebody has been murmuring. You know, somebody is preaching and in the murmuring before the preaching, you can tell, you can tell. Somebody is singing and the fellow has been murmuring before the singing, you can tell how it comes out. Somebody is trying to give you food. You know, you, he wants to serve you food. And it's okay, take your want to eat, take the food. And you can tell. The fellow has been murmuring before you came to serve you the food, you can tell. You even lose appetite, although the food is there. The attitude in which it is served, the way they put it on the table, and the way they have been murmuring before they came to serve you the food, you can tell. Somebody is trying to give you a helping hand to help you carry the load. And you can tell the way they help you carry the load if they have been murmuring before they came. And you say, so all this, whatever it is you do, just, just be free and just be happy. And let the joy of the Lord be the strength of your life. And it says, do all things without memories in the plural and disputings in the plural. 
That's quiet, silent, unspoken murmuring. That's a loud murmuring, verbal, spoken out. But others, they don't speak out. The murmuring is just inside there. But it says, whatever you do anytime, let there be no murmuring. If it's going to be acceptable before the Lord, that she may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, and more women shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. You are not run in vain. But you know, if we murmur, everything we do, although we're still there, I say, well, I'm doing it because of God. If it were because of coordinator, I'll not do what I'm doing. If it's because of pastor, I'll not do this one. If it were, if it were because of good coordinator reaching overseas, I will not do this one. But I'm going to do it because I'm a child of God. That's more more now. That's complaint. If it were because of this, I will not do that. I'm telling you, I'm just staying here. And I'm just doing this. That's my consecration. I'm just there. If I think about, you know, this and this and that, I will not be here. Yeah, that's murmuring. Oh, what's murmuring again? Do what you need to do with a free heart. And all the if it were not if cut it off. And be happy in the service of the Lord. That you even have a chance, a privilege, to get this done. To be a blessing to different lives and to many other people in your life. And say, praise the Lord. There are better qualified people. And I'm wondering that any of these apostles, I hope you apostles, you're humble. Stephen could have been an apostle. Right? Right? Yes. Look at that man. When he was stoning him, he looked up into heaven. And he saw Jesus Christ standing on the right hand of majesty on high. With all the stone coming upon him, he just said, Oh Lord, don't count this against them. It doesn't hurt me at all. They are hurting themselves. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. I'm saying, that man could have been an apostle. So if you're an apostle, don't think that you have no replacement. Look at Philip. He went all alone unto Samaria. No supporter, no helper, no second, no partner, nobody, no choir, nobody at all. And all alone there, nothing. And the whole city came to the Lord. I said, wait a minute, this man could have been an apostle. But he wasn't called apostle. And if you are called apostle, don't be proud, don't think I'm there, nobody else can do this. What thousands of other people that can do it? That's the reason you are humble and the memory will be cut off. And thank God, Stephen and Philip, they were not competing. They didn't say, I can be an apostle, look at my quality, look at my qualification. They just remain there without quarreling with anybody. That's the Christian attitude. Whatever you have to do, therefore, do without murmuring and do without disputing, holding forth. The word of life. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain. You are not run in vain. Neither labored in vain. You are not labor in vain in Jesus' name. And the true disciple manifests gratitude rather than murmuring. Why? Oh, he says, all this and heaven too. He counts his blessing. He says, Lord, I'm just counting my blessing. I don't have any time to grumble. I don't have any time to murmur. Well, he rejoices with his possession. What does he possess? Age. He possesses the hope of heaven. He says, look at my family. Look at my relatives. None has hope of heaven like I do. The privilege I have. The hope of heaven that I have. I'm so happy what God has done for me. He has saved my soul. Christ in me, the hope of glory. He says, that's enough. I'm counting my blessing. Oh, opportunities from the omnipotent. He says, look at all the opportunities I have in the house of the Lord. Look at this church, a deeper life. And look at opportunities the Lord has given me in a church like this. Look at these thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are here. That somebody can be brought here to sing to these thousands of people. What an opportunity. 
or to teach, or to pray, or to lead, or to even come and do anything. What an opportunity. And it's, the opportunity is not for me. I didn't give you the opportunity. It's God that gave you opportunities from the omnipotent. El, the love of the Lord. He just showers his love upon us. And we say, what kind of God is this? How much has loved us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the inheritance of disciples who are delivered from murmuring. They say, Why should I murmur? Look at the inheritance I have. Look at all the promises for me from Genesis Revelation. Anything I need any time, ask, it shall be given you. Seek, you shall find, and knock, it shall be opened unto you. And because of the inheritance that is from the incorruptible one. Why should I murmur? What? What reason do I need to murmur? In the newness of nature. Newness of nature. I know what I used to be. I know what I used to think. I know where I used to be, where I used to go. But look at the newness of nature that is Give ten hours. <laughs> go away with your ten hours. What do I care about the ten naira? Look at what I have. And when you count your blessing, the newness of nature that you have, what joy you have, eh? the expectation in eternity. Expectation in the other, the Lord Jesus Christ and beloved ones of God. What I complain about, and eternity is so close, eternity is so near, just walk today and walk tomorrow, and the following day you will be perfected. The expectation in eternity is satisfaction in his service. No joy like the joy of serving the Lord. No joy like the joy of Sunday is the sunny day. Is the best day of the week when you come together and the joy of seeing beautiful faces of the children of God and all the sweat and all the hassles of the week, everything done, and then you are going to serve the Lord on that Sunday. The joy, the satisfaction that you have in service that's enough. That as you are counting your blessings and counting them one by one, what have you got to grumble about to murmur about? The final is the shield of the supernatural. That it says, and your shield, and your refuge, and your tower, and the righteous runneth into that tower, and is secured the shield of the supernatural that we have. And you know, sometimes you lose a little one button from your shirt. And because of the one button you lose from your shirt, you forget the quality of that shirt. You forget how clean and how wonderful that shirt is. You forget that nobody else has that shirt but you. Just because a button is missing in that shirt. You know, sometimes it's because of, you know, they serve the table and the food is wonderful and good. And then because somebody forgot to put a bowl of water there for you to wash your hands, because of that, the whole of the heavens must come down. And then you shout and scream and murmur and complain. Hey, wait a minute. Look at the rest of things on the table. Just that bowl of water to wash your hand. You can get up yourself and go to the sink and bring the water yourself. No big deal. Count your blessing and see what the Lord has done. And stop more about this little botching that is missing there. And you know, little thing that is not the little thing that is not there. And see the holiness of disciples who are delivered from murmuring the hope of heaven, the opportunities of the omnipotent, and the love of the Lord, and the inheritance of being corruptible, the newness of nature, expectation, eternity, satisfaction in service, and the shield of the supernatural. As you come to your blessing, I pray all this morning will stop in our lives in Jesus' name. We're looking at Psalm 15, I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 15, verse 1. Psalm 15, verse 1, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle, who shall dwell in thy holy hill. Then it says, he that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness, 
speaketh the truth in his heart, he that baptizeth not with his tongue, no doeth evil to his neighbor, no taketh up reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own heart and changeth not, he that putteth not out his money to use, uh, is, he putteth not out his money to use, and he takes not reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things, just live a peaceful life, a righteous life, a holy life, no more money, no dispute, no complete, no argument. He that doeth this sin shall never be moved. I pray that will be you. I said that will be you. That this very day he'll deliver every one of us from murmuring in Jesus' name. Let's rest up and talk to the Lord in prayer. This deadly disease in the body killing people prematurely, complaining, arguing, disputing, murmuring, criticizing, condemning, let's pray. The Lord will cure us, heal us of this deadly, life-threatening disease. Murmuring does no man any good. Murmuring does no woman any good. Murmuring does no human being, young or old, any good. It's unwise to murmur against God. It's unwise to murmur against leadership in the church. What you endure from your principles. You can endure more than that from your pastor, from the group coordinator. From the coordinator, from the leaders in the church, don't allow that festering evil to take root in your life. The murmuring and the grumbling and the complaining against the pastor in the church. Against the leaders in the church to kill your soul, destroy you. Stoning Moses does not solve your problem, makes you vulnerable to greater problems, to the Amalekites. Striving, grumbling, murmuring. And because of an important things, you know, food, time, water, provision, non essentials. One week delay, one month delay of a particular thing. Salvation makes us new creatures, changes our speech. Changes our character, changes our lifestyle, cuts off the murmuring, cuts off the grumbling. Don't be a perpetual backslider. That the messages of the Word of God. Never have any impact again. 
the life from the Lamb. Living by the life from the Lamb. What do I have to complain about? What do I have to murmur about? The inheritance of the incorruptible. Lord, as you've given to me, I'm forever grateful. Forever grateful. I'll sing a thousand songs, I'll walk a thousand miles, just for the joy of counting my blessings one by one. I'll be, I'll be happy all the day through, all the way, because of the inheritance of the incorruptible, because of the newness of nature that you granted me. Lord, this is good. Lord, this is wonderful. Never knew it could be so sweet. This is great. Nothing to worry about. Nothing to complain about. Nothing to murmur about. Satisfaction in His service. The joy. The satisfaction. In his service. That makes Sunday. Your happiest day in the week. Your sunniest day in the week. A day of sunshine. And gladness. What do you have to complain about? What do you have to murmur about? With all the satisfaction in his service that he gives unto you, then the shield and the shelter of the supernatural that he grants unto you. Count your blessings and name them one by one. We will see what the Lord has done for you. Then you will know you have no reason on earth to ever murmur, ever grumble, ever complain. 